Good morning, everyone. It's it's 10 o'clock, so um, I'm sure we'll get some stragglers joining. Um, but I'll just go through the housekeeping to start. Um, I think probably you all know me, but just in case, I'm Jenny Walsh. I'm the clinical lead for South East Region for um, perinatal mental health. And it's just Yvette and I running the webinar today because Liz Cullen is in Denmark on um, the Hope Exchange programme, looking at services over there. So um, I'm sure she'll have some interesting stuff to tell us when she gets back. So um, in time-honoured fashion, um, please mute your line and turn your video off until that, unless you want to ask a question. Um, Raise your hand to let us know you want to ask a question or give feedback. Share your comments and reflections in the chat. Um, and do introduce yourself with your name and role and organisation. It's always nice to know who's on the call. And we are recording this webinar, so um, it will be shared on the Southeast Clinical Deliveries Net and Networks um, website and YouTube. Just just to let you know. So today's theme is dads and partners, and um, it, this is a a really crucial um, topic for us in perinatal mental health. Um, not least because it's actually one of the flexible ambitions of a long term plan that we can work with dads, and I think. We're hoping later on to show a tool that may be helpful to you all in your work with dads and partners, because um, although the ambition talks about assessment, I don't think when we interpret it, we're really talking about a full psychosocial holistic assessment. Um, but it's more about because we're the services that are that are working with dads um, that we can we get we get that lovely opportunity to just check in with dad about their mental health because we know there's a high prevalence if mum has a mental health problem then often dad will present as well so um i so in our second um presentation we've got um a little tool that we want to share with you that might just help with that ambition um, first of all, we've got um, Elliot Ray, who a lot of you will know from from the television, from lots of social media. He's going to tell us about his work and his story. And then last but not least, we've got um, Julian to talk to us about DadPad. And um, I remember DadPad from very early days, and it's just been so amazing to see how it's developed and different things have been, um, different sort of iterations of it have, have come, so the neonatal one and various ones. So I think that's going to be really exciting. Um, in, so I think that's what we'll do then. We will, you'll get the resources out um, as a pack. There's, just to let you know the sort of stuff that was in there in terms of the national update it was quite brief this morning but we were just sending out the reminder about the benchmarking exercise for specialist teams and any parent infant teams that have had that the closing date is the 10th of june there were a couple of awareness um weeks coming up gypsy and traveler is one that's coming up in june and just a reminder to Southeast colleagues that the Gypsy and Traveller Awareness Training is still available on the Academy. Um, and the other Awareness Week is the Infant Mental Health Awareness in June. So um, that, that's obviously a biggie for us. So look out for that one. Um, and then we did have a number of slides for Southeast colleagues for the forthcoming training that you can access via the Academy. Um, OK, so I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our first speaker, who is Elliot Ray. 
um, and he's going to talk to us about his story. Um, Elliot, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, I'm always seeing you sort of on the telly, on the social media and stuff. So it's a real privilege for, that you've come and um, spoken to us today. So thank you so much. And I'm going to hand over to you, Elliot, and you're going to tell us your story. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I hope you're all doing well. It's been a it's been a crazy morning for me. It's been a crazy week, to be honest. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what I was up to yesterday. But we had a a big event that we were doing uh, largely around dads, supporting dads, um, mainly through the workplace. So that was a pretty big event. So I think I spent the last two weeks just focusing on that, and I'm finally I can finally breathe. <laughs> so it's amazing to kind of come back down to earth and uh, and do the work I love to do so much, which is talk about how we can support dads better, um, talk about how, you know, society I think needs to catch up now with with where we're at, which is that dads are doing more, feeling more, um, and need more support as well for a variety of different reasons. So I'm thinking I'm gonna do this in three parts and we've got some time for questions at the end. So I'm gonna spend the first little bit talking about me personally and, and my story. Uh, the second bit talking about the work we do and me and the team through Music Football Fatherhood. And I think I'll go on after that to speak a little bit about kind of my reflections around uh, the, the good support that I think I've seen through dads, what can be done better to engage dads through the maternity process as well. Um, so to start for myself, so I um, I was gonna say I'm 38, I'm 39 now, I turned 39 last week. <laughs> and six years ago, six and a half years ago, me and my wife decided to start a family. Um, so we were, I was broody. I don't know if that's a term that is used for men. Maybe it is, <laughs> but I was definitely broody. I, I would go to the park and I would see dads with their children on the swings. And, I, you know, I wanted that. I was, I was ready for that. So we started trying for a family and conceived very, very quickly. I think as pregnancies go, you know, the, the pregnancy for us was relatively smooth as pregnancies go. Um, and we had, you know, no, 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 no big issues. But the two weeks before the due date came, we had a letter through the post and I'll never forget this letter. It came, came in the post and it looked like a, an advert for a new takeaway. It was, it was like a pamphlet kind of thing with a letter attached. And the letter said that, you know, through some routine tests with, we found that you uh, have group B strep. And that means that you're going to have to have intravenous antibiotics during the birth. So my wife was going to have these antibiotics during the birth. So we were very worried because I'd never heard of group B strep before. So obviously concerned. And then when you Google, even more concerned when you find out how serious this infection can be. So we're pretty worried, to be honest. And luckily, we had a an appointment with with uh, our, our, our contact at the NHS at the time, and she kind of put us at ease and told us, look, the, ant the antibiotics are going to be okay, it'll all be fine, it's kind of routine stuff. So we were okay, we went into the into into the labor room and the birth, and it started off quite serene. We had a birthing pool and it was all very nice. And I remember there was a, a nice midwife, it was cream wool, wool, walls, nice music playing. It was very, <laughs> very calm and very relaxing. But that changed pretty quickly when there were some heart rate scares. My wife's temperature uh, rose quite heavily. And so we were, we were taken into a another room, into the main labor ward. And that's when the that's when it all kind of started, really. You know, there was lots of scares. There was lots of points where the midwife would bang this big red button and loads of nurses and doctors would running in. Seen from nowhere. It was like an episode of casualty. They'll just run from nowhere. They would do loads of checks, temperature checks, you know, they'd put stuff on my wife's belly to check the, how the baby's doing. And that lasted for about 24 hours. And when my daughter's cut finally came out, she was brought out by Von Chus. And that moment when, you know, you expect your baby to cry and for, for the joy in the room to overtake you, you know, for us, that, that didn't happen. And then he came out and she was laid on my wife's chest. Um, and she wasn't breathing and she was gray and she was lifeless and she was still. So the nurse quickly realized that, took her to one side of the room 
and they were doing resuscitation. They were sucking fluid out of their airways with a, with a straw. And on the other side of the room, there was my wife who was bleeding out a lot of blood. She was losing loads of blood. So I can't remember the exact number, but it felt like there was about 10 doctors and nurses around both of them working on them, ultimately trying to save their lives. And you know, for all of my adult life, that was that and the moments that followed were definitely the, 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 the times I've been most scared and the most helpless and also the most numb, you know, kind of feeling like you're, it's not happening. You're kind of feeling like you're watching a TV program or you're the fly on the wall, you know, I, definitely having an out of body experience, just looking at it and, and ob observing what's going on. And then the doctor said, do you want to go to, to, uh, to, I to ICU with your daughter or do you want to stay here? So I went to ICU with my daughter and we spent the next two weeks in that hospital, Harlow Hospital, Princess Alexandra. They gave us a room so we, we could all stay. So after a couple of days of going back and forth and going home, I was able to stay in the hospital with them both. So we stayed there getting treatment for the group B strep. And after two weeks, we got the good news that we could go home. Um, but then my daughter got a big bump in the back of her head. And that was when the doctors really started worrying. We had specialists come in from other hospitals. Um, the midwives were, you know, make, bringing us dinner, <laughs> asking if we wanted more tea. Um, you know, they were, they, were, they were overcompensating, I guess, because they were worried about us at that moment and what was going to happen. They weren't qu quite sure if it was a blood clot or, you know, what had happened. So that night was definitely the hardest. We were joined by a midwife called Nagmer and we prayed together for about five, six hours. We cried. I've never cried that much in my life. So the next morning we had an emergency MRI scan to see what was going on. So we went for the emergency MRI scan the next day and then got the amazing news that we could go home. It was just bone structure. I think for me that and for us that was definitely the, the end of that but the beginning of the rest of our lives if you like when we were going home still struggling to process and accept what had happened I went back into a, a busy job my paternity leave had finished my wife was at home struggling she was eventually diagnosed with postnatal anxiety difficult you know, finding it difficult to leave the house we were super paranoid about my daughter's health we went to A&E about every week I think for the first eight eight weeks we were in A&E we would just go in it for any reason on Saturday night at 3 p.m just because she had a temperature or she was coughing we we're just so paranoid we'd go back to A&E every week and when I look back I think how mad that was but at the time it just felt like the right thing to do but obviously that was a result of you know my wife's anxiety and I was eventually diagnosed with PTSD like I'm a very extroverted confident person but in that 18 months after my daughter was born I was going to work and you know struggling to say hello to my team struggling to speak up in a meeting struggling to do anything really other than just the basics um struggling to sleep in severe insomnia having lots of flashbacks about what had happened continually thinking back in my mind what what, what would happen what could i have done differently why did this happen like struggling to accept and process that feeling really anxious, breaking down on the train, crying, like, you know, th those kind of, th th what you'd see as the symptoms of PTSD, basically. And for me, in terms of getting support, it was kind of by accident, actually. I, what I did, I started writing. I started my platform, Music Football Fatherhood. I started writing about just parenting in general. And someone reached out to me because they wanted me to come and do a podcast, I think it was, and they asked me about my experience of being a dad and they asked me about the birth and this is the first time someone had asked me about the birth so I spoke to them about the birth and couldn't get through couldn't get through the conversation to be honest and and they had a friend who was a birth trauma specialist so she said why don't you talk to this this person so I called them and then kind of got support through through that way but it was kind of by accident <laughs> to be honest and I always think about that and I think about the ideas of like what it means to be a man and the ideas of masculinity and the fact that now, I didn't talk to anyone apart from my wife. I didn't talk to my manager, my colleagues, my friends. You know, we're very good at, as humans of putting a brave face on things. And my, my understanding of that now is, is it's, it's much deeper now. I understand that us as human beings, we can come to work or go to, to functions or whatever it is and put a mask on, put a brave face on. But you never really know what's going on underneath unless you, you ask, ask that person, you know, or you have a good relationship where you, where you can we can dig deep under the surface. So my daughter's six now, healthy little girl. Um, I think as parents, you'll know as your children get older, it gets a bit easier in some ways. 
gets more challenging in other ways. Now she's uh, very inquisitive. Just the other day, we were driving to school. I was going up, up and then down this hill, and we stopped at some traffic lights, and she looked at me in the mirror. She's like, Dad, wh- wh- why don't dino- where are dinosaurs? Why, <laughs> why aren't they alive anymore? So I started giving some answers about extinction and evolution. Clearly, I didn't really know what I was talking about. And she looked at me dead in the eye and said, Daddy, it's okay. Come back to me when you know the answer. <laughs> So yeah, it's funny. I love being a dad. It keeps it keeps me entertained and uh, tired, and and busy as well. But now I'm lucky enough to spend all my time doing things that supports dads, doing things to change the way we look at parenting and fatherhood. And through through that difficult period when when you know the first eighteen months of my daughter's life, when I started writing, and I started a blog called Music Football Fatherhood. And it was just me, just kind of, you know, all the things I like, music, football, and fatherhood, writing about that, reflections on fatherhood, what's the latest football news, you know, just, just things that I wanted to reflect on. And over the years, more and more dads got involved and more and more dads wanted to share their stories as well. And so for what went from a very kind of personal space uh, has now become a platform that's supported thousands of dads across the UK. We're all about having open conversations about fatherhood. We're all about creating a safe space and community spaces for dads to gather, whether online or in person, to have the conversations that we as men find it difficult to do. I think sometimes we've had shoulder to shoulder relationships for a long time in terms of male friendships. And I think it's about keeping that, but also doing a bit more face to face as well and having that face to face relationship. So that's what we're all about. And we do that for a variety of different ways. We will talk about issues around loss, Um, Co-parenting is a big one. Race and culture, we'll talk about relationships, raising a child with neurodiversity and autism. Um, Any subject is is on the table, mental health, gender roles, all that sort of stuff. And we do it through a variety of different ways. Sometimes dads just want to consume our content. So we have a blog and a podcast just for dads who just want to listen and learn. They don't necessarily want to engage, they just want to listen from afar, and that's, that's, that's all good. Sometimes dads want to get a bit more involved as well, so we do community events, like we do The Lodge, which is monthly online sessions for dads, which is you know completely free. Dads come on Zoom, we have guest speakers, breakout rooms, good conversation, really, really fun, informal sessions. And then we also have Extra Time, which is our partnerships with football clubs, um, where we they have, give us access to their stadium, we do talks around mental health um it's like a football themed fatherhood conversation we've got brentford coming up on saturday the 18th of june day before father's day we've done queen's park rangers we've got um arsenal coming up in in august as well and for me as a big football fan that is the best (laughs) thing ever (laughs) so so yeah we do a lot of a lot of um events and gatherings of people get bringing people together we also have published a book called dad published it last year uh, for father's day and there's a really interesting story behind the book, actually, because we approached publishers with the idea. Okay, it's 20 dads, normal dads, sharing their stories around you know, gay fatherhood, mental health, um, co-parenting, stillbirth, miscarriage. You know, all, all those topics are covered in the book. And it's 20 dads writing from a really open place. So we approached publishers with the idea. And the feedback we had was that, oh, you're not famous. So you know, no, no one's going to buy the book. So I knew that wasn't true. So we started a crowdfunder. We raised twelve thousand pounds in in two weeks. We really, we self published the book last year on Father's Day on first of June last year, uh, and the book's gone on to be an Amazon top ten bestseller. It's been a top twenty bestseller for the Hive, which is the independent bookstores. It's been featured all across the mainstream media. Um, it's embraced by a lot of NHS trusts and a lot of the kind of uh, the, the baby rooms and and the groups in the NHS hospitals. And so many dads have said it's been a friend to them. You know, it's been a source of support for them. They've seen themselves in the book. And for me, I think that's an interesting story because I think when we're talking about fathers and dads, you know, that 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 rejection that we had, that no one was no one's going to buy it because you're not famous, is I think <laughs> sadly a bit of a reflection. Is that you know, the the everyday dad voice is not always heard. And I think there's a responsibility for us, everyone, to to do more to listen, but also encourage dads to speak up a little bit more as well. And the success of the book, I think, has proved to me that we have moved to a place where dads are being more open and being more vulnerable and are more involved in their children's lives than ever before the pandemic you know one of the good things about pandemic has has been that we also need to move it on and as well and through all the different ways that we can support dads we need to look at how we can do that too 
Um, so the book has lent, launched, has led to me, you know, presenting my own BBC documentary, Becoming Dad, which was on, still on the iPlayer. It was on um, BBC One and in January. And that documentary is, it's a, uh, yeah, very moving. You know, this conversation with me and my dad in there. My wife is in there. My daughter's in there. I speak to Jessica Reed, Chief Midwifery Officer for NHS England, about the support for dads. Had a great conversation. Spoke to Andrea Ledsom, MP, who is looking after, you know, Conservative MP, looking after the budget for the early years funding in terms of the family hubs and stuff like that. Spoke to so many new dads about their anxieties and what they're looking forward to about becoming fathers. Um, they followed us in our music football fatherhood work and came to a couple of our events. So it was, it was an amazing documentary. So please do watch that. It's on the iPlayer, Becoming Dad. I think that really summarizes um, not just our work, but I think the conversation that we need to start, I think need to continue to have about support for dads. And we also do um, a lot around the workplace as well. So as I said yesterday, I was uh, launching the Working Dads Employer Awards in Parliament. It's, it's Music Football Fatherhood and the University of Birmingham. And we were recognizing employers that are doing good work to support working dads. For example, through parental leave policies, um, through flexible working, and so yeah it was a, it was a great event and i'm pretty tired because <laughs> we were celebrating after but it was it was amazing and i think it's really moving forward like you know from the from a corporate employer perspective how we can support dads in that way so i want to i want to end for a few minutes just to talk about before we go to questions around mental health support and more holistic support for dads and i think the different ways that we can do that and the responsibility of the different groups to do that so i think there's definitely space for peer support so what we do um, in music football fatherhood is, is is we are peer support we're not professionals we are a group of of, of dads um, and some mums <laughs> who who want to share who want to have the open conversation and I think there are other groups that you know do, will do similar things and I think it's so important to to embrace those local groups uh, whether it's particularly dads or like Andy's man club for, for, for men or in in south um, of England there is uh what they called dad la soul or there's leeds dads in leeds you know so there's lo there's there's local groups but also you know national groups as well and i think it's about embracing that them and supporting them to do their thing because sometimes dads don't need professional mental health support but they, they do need peer support and somewhere to go to and someone to talk to so that's that's really important i think government has a role in this you know when i spoke to andrew Ledson in the documentary looking at the family hubs particularly that that is being set up in local communities where if you have a new baby you can go along advice support community making sure they are inclusive for dads making sure the staff understand some of the challenges that dads might have making sure there's resources that dads can use that speaks to them you know making sure if, if they're a single dad or they or just they have their baby that day and they're a go along by themselves that they are able to be comfortable in that environment um, and so that's the that's a big piece, you know, and I think there's a lot of responsibility for government, not just in that, but in, in all the kind of policies they do to make sure that dads are front and centre and all the services are designed with dads in mind are inclusive of fathers. As I mentioned, I think the workplace has a massive role to play here um, and some are doing some good work, but that needs to needs to definitely improve. And lastly, I think it's about what you will do um, through maternity services, through the NHS. You know, I'm a massive supporter of the NHS. My personal experience was amazing. You know, that midwife I mentioned, Nagme, that came and prayed with us and just the support that we were given, you know, over that two weeks, it was so special. And seeing how hard <laughs> they were working was really a humbling experience, you know. So, um, yeah, I just want to put that on, put, say that, that I think the NHS staff, sometimes there's bad press, but you all do amazing work. So thank you for your work. There are a few things that I think can be done to it to engage dads and I would like to kind of talk about those a little bit. So I think when it comes to in early engagement, I think that's really important. Early engagement, um, how, how do we engage the dads at the beginning of, of the whole maternity process? That's really important. I think if a dad can feel involved at the beginning, he's more likely to then be involved later on. So thinking about that very first appointment, how, how do you embrace that dad? How do you bring him into the process? How do you make him feel like he's part of this, that he's uh, you know, an active, fully involved dad and, and talk to him in that way? I think language is important, you know, talking about dads and fathers rather than terms like women and families, you know, talking to them using parent based language rather than just partner based language. You know, talk to them as a expectant parent, not just a partner and a support person. 
I think resource, resources are really important. We're going to talk about the dad pad later on. I think offering resources and things that the dads can take away, you know, from my experience, dads sometimes want to just read in their own time, you know, so giving them resources that speak to them specifically to dads, to fathers, including signposting to services that they can access at their own convenience, whether that is peer support groups or, any, or anything else. But I think those resources are really important. You know, they're so powerful. Giving something someone that that speaks to them, that's really important. I think there's something about universal support here. Um, so, you know, the early engagement, the 12 week scan, the 20 week scan, the delivery room, NICU, if need, if, if you know, if that happens, home visits, making sure everyone through that process has the uh, awareness, the training to to be able to include the whole family. Um, and a lot of this stuff is very personal. You know, it's very personal. It's very much about personal perspective, sometimes personal bias. But how how do you as a as a home visitor, how do you as a, a midwife in the delivery room in ICU make sure that that dad is feeling and is included in part of that process? Again, language, again, resources, um, body language, mindfulness about an understanding of what that dad might be feeling and experiencing, you know, making sure we're taking the time to ask him how he's doing. Um, eye contact, all those sort of things, small things, but are super, super serious, important in this. And I think the last thing I want to talk about is inclusion, you know, being aware of cultural and religious context that may inform behavior or decisions. In our MFF community, it's very diverse and we hear stories from different dads who have different religions or cultures, and that can play a big part in in the way they see the world and uh, and maybe how they're being informed by family and friends, you know, so I think doing the work to understand that and having that cultural awareness is really important. But this this work is key, you know, support for mums in the Dads Matter survey, which is a company up in um, integrated NHS service up in Manchester. They found that 86 percent of mums said the dad was the most important factor in their mental health. You know, one in five mums will have postnatal depression. One in 10 dads will experience some type of postnatal depression in the first six months. And, and they are 50 percent more likely to have PND if their partner does. That's from research from Mark Williams, the father's reaching out. And encouraging support for, for baby, you know, secure attachment in the first two years is linked to better outcomes in regards to resilience and well-being. So mental health for parents is the biggest barrier to attachment. So there's so many reasons why we need to do this work. It's so important. Thank you for all you're doing now. But I would really compel you to, to really think about how do you, at a personal level and a, a systemic level, engage dads through the maternity process. I'll pause there and see if there's any questions for me. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for the space and time. That's brilliant, Elliot. Thank you so much. And um, there's been some comments in the chat I've just been watching about, you know, people thanking you for sharing your story. I guess even though you've shared it on a number of occasions, I'm sure it doesn't get that much easier to do so, you know, because it, it's pretty gruelling, isn't it? What happened to you in the beginning is... Um, really really difficult stuff um oh there's a there's a comment here um from from jenny tata um says you'll probably have seen the reports released this week from five times more and birth rights about racism in maternity services one of the startling statistics is that black women are more likely to be involuntary admitted do you i think that's probably vol involuntary admitted yeah to a mother and baby unit than white British women uh -huh. this is an issue of access not engagement do you have a view on how we improve improve access to services um access so what well, well, I'm not quite sure like exactly what you mean by access to services do you want is to it, pop up yeah, Jenny and stage say Is she not there? No, no. Okay. I mean, I, I can give my general reflections about what I think about that. Sorry. So. I've got, oh, here she is. Brilliant. I've got a really Hi. slow um, internet connection, so sorry. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're fine. Great. Um, yeah, it's about, so, so what the statistics showed was that um, there were actually lower uh, non-engagement with um, clinicians from black women. 
So they would attend um, community mental health appointments, they would attend GP appointments, they would attend midwifery appointments, um, but it wasn't progressing enough for the clinician to raise the alarm so that they could get the help that they needed for perinatal mental health. So what happened in the end was that um, many of them were having to be involuntary admitted because their perinatal mental health had deteriorated to such a great degree that they needed support in a mother and baby unit. Um, and that shouldn't have happened. They should have got that help earlier because they were engaging with the services. So it's really about what do you think might be the barriers that are in the way of clinicians having those conversations with black mothers in particular to enable them to get the support that they need yeah okay thank you for clarifying that so you know i'll speak from a, i'm not i'm not an expert in this area but i'll speak from a perspective of just a more of a personal perspective of what, of what i think and i think that when it comes to you know relationships ultimately like we're looking at relationships here in terms of how do two individuals take away their their roles in that particular experience, an example, but just two individuals, you know, two human beings. And I think what we see through, whether it's work or um, the police, or in this example, through maternity and childbirth, is that that kind of bias, whether it's conscious or unconscious, gets in the way of a, a trust and a relationship forming and, and, and bonding. And I think when there are two different people who maybe see, have different experiences, see each other, see the world differently, they don't necessarily have a, a point of reference or a shared experience. And especially when there is, for example, a white person in that position of the power in that time, whether it's through the police or, or the education system, and they see a, a black mum or a black person. What we know about bias and the way that works and how that impacts relationship is that they, they can view them differently. They can maybe not, like their own bias can get in the way of their decisions or how much they make an effort to build a relationship or how much they pay attention to that person's pain or how they judge their work how they perceive them you know and and I think that just exists that exists through life you know whether it's conscious or unconscious whether it's racism or microaggressions or well-meaning people or not well-meaning people that can often exist and so I think when it comes to this and, and lots of other different walks of life is that that relationship just isn't there that trust isn't there so the mum thinks this is not someone that I really want to lean on they don't get me, mm. they don't understand me. That might be true in a lot of cases. Um, this is not a place I feel safe. These are not people that are looking after me that have my best interests at heart. So they don't engage back, you know? And we know that when it comes to black people, and black women, mental health in general, you know, um, the higher rates of mental health, higher inequalities in lots of different areas of life add additional pressures on just existing and being a human being so that's all kind of compounded you know and I think for the the the, the healthcare professional in this instance they have to do the deep work to really think about how they're engaging with with people so the the cultural work the the human work to think about to understand people to try and understand people to listen to be aware of their own bias, really be aware. And you know, this is deep work. <laughs> this is really deep work. You can't just do this in a day. This is work, it's lifetime work, you know, especially when you're under pressure. And I know that when, when people are under pressure, they fall back on their bias and everyone's under pressure these days. So when you have a lot of people to see, you fall back on your bias, you make assumptions, you make judgments, you say things that if you look back at, maybe you think you, I, sh I shouldn't have phrased it that way. You miss things, you know? So it is about the, indivi the individual doing the work to think about how they are engaging with people. That's really that helpful. Help. Yeah, brilliant and really well articulated. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Thanks a lot. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Jenny, for the question. And also thank you once again, Elliot, for coming to talk for us today. I think um, there's nothing as powerful as hearing that um, voice of somebody that's sort of been there and done it. And um, it just makes such perfect sense, doesn't it, that we start to really include dads more. And, um, you know, I think with our services, all of us that are on this call, we're all in such a good position to make sure we are just checking in with dad and making sure um, dad's OK, too, because it's such a massive part of um, early parenthood, isn't it? Getting yeah. getting through it together. You need each other. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK, there's another question in the chat, but I think we're going to have to move on. I don't know if you can stay for any more, Elliot, whether you could just answer that question in the chat box. Um, I don't think I can see the chat. I don't know if it's my MS Teams, but recently I haven't uh, had the chat okay. box. Um, so Stephen's asked if there are any examples of good practice around midwifery and uh, birth ward proactively including partners are there I'm sure there's midwives on the call maybe that can answer that in the chat if if that's okay and then we'll move on yeah I, I, just quickly on that so I'll just just 30 seconds I think dad matters in Manchester um, is amazing they are integrated I think they're from home start service in the NHS in greater Manchester definitely have a look at them because they have the great practice of of uh, you know that that presence uh, throughout the process, which is amazing. Um, and just lastly to say thank you very much. If you want to get in contact with me, then you go to our website, musicfootballfatherhood.com. Um, my email address is, I've got Gmail at the moment, I am Elliot Ray at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, if you wanted to signpost your your, your dads to us, then you know feel free to. We've got loads of resources, the book, the documentary, um, community events that they can attend. It's all so uh, most of the things are free as well. So that's that's really open for them. But thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And I'll, I'll stay on the line to listen to the rest of it. Thank you. That's brilliant. You. OK, our. Um, so I'm introducing our next speaker. Jules, are you OK to share your? Yes, lovely. There we go. Um, somebody unlike me who can get around the technology. So actually, I am part of this presentation with Jules, but I'm I'm not going to be doing very much of it. I think you've heard enough from me already. Um, so. We want to introduce and launch the perinatal pathways screening tool. Um, we've back in the day um, when we were Wessex, we did an audit of the whole perinatal pathway and at that time we didn't have even a long-term plan so we certainly didn't have a dads and partners ambition but what we were being told by particularly midwives but also health visitors is that they knew that they should be asking questions about dads um, about mum's mental health at that time but they didn't always know what to do with the answers and so what was happening then was that a lot of sort of inappropriate referrals were going into specialist perinatal teams because midwives were very unsure about the rest of the pathway. Um, so I developed this tool to triage women to the right part of the pathway and then Jules has used it extensively in maternity services and then much more recently we've added in a pathway for dads. So Jules is going to sort of talk, talk us through it and explain um, about, about the tool and some of the work she's done to evaluate it. Um, and then this will be available from today for anybody to use that want that thinks it might be helpful to their service so um and also dads and and mums can use it for themselves it it doesn't have to be with a health professional um so we're hoping that 
because I think sometimes that dad's ambition in the long term plan, people overcomplicate it a bit. And in in my world, which is as those of you that know me will know, it's quite a simplistic world. I think let's keep things as simple as possible. So a simple tool that just gets you to the right part of the pathway and helps you navigate through. To me, I think that that is supporting our dads and um, hopefully Anyway, I will stop waffling now. I'll hand over to Jules because hopefully you can you can see the tool, hear all about it and see if it's something that you think might be helpful in your service. So over to Jules. I'm just resharing Jenny just because I realised I didn't include the sound a moment ago. Um, thank you, Jenny. OK, so um, I appreciate that today's webinar is about dads and partners. However, um, to give you the background to this tool and where we are today, I need to start by setting the scene with the maternity. So do bear with me. So within maternity, where, where were we when it came to screening? Well, we were routinely asking women the hooli questions at booking and around 28 weeks gestation. And we'd also inquire about emotional wellbeing uh, to each face-to-face -face contact. However, as Jenny's also said, the fact remains that a lot of healthcare practitioners, not just midwives, didn't know what to do with the information that they gained from asking the Hooli questions or from women's disclosures that followed the Hooli questions. So one option is to use the GAD7 or PH and or PHQ9 screening tools that can help you get more information and to identify the severity of mental health need when we're talking about depression or anxiety. However, again, and I'm talking specifically about maternity, the barrier to the use of these tools is a lack of knowledge about them, a lack of confidence in using them in practice, because we have the same um, outcome as when we ask the Healy questions. Clinicians often don't know what to do with the result. The score on its own is meaningless if it's not used to offer signposting to support or to inform a care plan. In fact, the majority of the emails that were coming into the midwifery perinatal mental health inbox were asking the specialist midwives, what do we do with this information that's been disclosed? Where do we send women for support? So we came to a situation whereby we recognised that the healthcare pre practitioner's confidence in asking screening questions to women was low because they just didn't know what to do with the answers. This then meant there was low identification of need. And then consequently, women were getting late access to support during the perinatal period. And we can't forget, of course, that one of the ambitions from the long term plan was to ensure that we had a means to assess the mental health needs of partners of pregnant people accessing our services. We can see here the um, ambition highlighted with the nice yellow arrows. So alongside a lack of confidence in the screening that was taking place for pregnant people, we were very much aware that we were not meeting the objective to screen partners either. So this became quite a driver for Jenny and myself to really come back to this tool and to um, invest our time, energy and effort in developing this online screening platform. So back in the summer of 2020, um, Jenny and myself began working on developing this, um, what Jenny had started and just developing this to um, overcome some of these um, issues we were continuing to see in practice, but also being mindful of this ambition of the long term plan. Our aim was really quite simple. We wanted to get it right for pregnant people, but also to meet the objective of the long term plan when it came to partners. Um, before we actually look at the tool, I just wanted to have a very brief reminder of the perinatal mental health care pathways. Um, I am aware that not everybody on the call today uses these pathways, so I'm conscious that when I say pathway B, for example, you might not know what I mean. So simply put, these are care pathways that relate to the significance or severity of the difficulty that has been experienced. We typically use pathways A to D to signify well-being or mild concerns up to D with crisis. Pathway E is very is slightly different and it sits apart um, to some degree because that represents our newly developed maternal mental health services and the inputs that pathway E can offer can sometimes run alongside um, input from um, providers that might be meeting the needs of women on pathways A to D. So it's just a very brief recap of the pathways as we go on to talk about them. 
So this brings us to the tool itself. So as we've said, the tool was designed to overcome barriers to screening during the perinatal period and to meet the objectives of the long term plan in terms of screening partners. The tool uses recognised and reliable evidence based measures to screen, triage and identify the appropriate referral pathway for that person. Our aim is to empower users to support healthcare practitioners um, to improve screening rates and increase access to services for pregnant people and their partners. And what I'd really like to do now is give you a live demonstration of the tool. Um, so just bear with me as I'm going to swap screens. Can I just um, have someone confirm to me that it has swapped for them? Yes, it has swapped. Yes. Thank you. OK, so this is this is the live site. So this is a site that um, when you follow the web link, this this is where you'll come. So um, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is, is this bar across the top here. Uh, this is an accessibility bar. So this has a number of functions. I'm going to start with the first, which is that the tool pathways about us. Perinatal pathways. Welcome, Welcome to perinatal pathway. I won't continue, but you get the drift. So we have the ability for the, the, the uh, website to read what's on the screen to us. For those with um, visual impairments, we also have the ability to highlight aspects of the text as we go through. Um, there are other aspects where we can highlight the text. And one of the most exciting things for me about this um, is our ability to change the language. Sorry, I've gone to the wrong one. So we have a huge number of um, language um, translations for this whole tool, so we can use it, as you can see, it's absolutely extensive. Um, and I don't know about um, colleagues on the call, but some of the more um, difficult language, like for example, in maternity, when we've had women that have came through the service that speak Pashto or Pashto, um, it's been quite difficult for us to um, access translation services. So we're really pleased that the accessibility function we have here has a huge array of languages. And I'm just going to very quickly randomly just go to Latvian um, and it just translates the whole tool over. So that's just the uh, accessibility functions of the website that's just really useful as clinicians to um, be aware of and to um, navigate around um, because obviously you will need to guide um, families that are using this questionnaire around that function. So if we start the questionnaire we will see that immediately there are two different um, directions that the tool can take us. So we have a mum slash pregnant person and a dad slash partner. You will notice that we've tried to use gender neutral and inclusive language throughout. So given that today um, the purpose is, is dads and partners, we will have a look at the dads and partners um, pathway. But I would really like to encourage you um, following the presentation today to visit the website and have a look at the mum slash pregnant person pathway because it is slightly different and I will talk about that shortly. So we go straight into, first of all, the PHQ-9 questions and all of these questions, as we know, the PHQ-9 is a robust evidence based measure. Um, we, we haven't amended the language in how the questions are asked at all. So I'm just going to, I'm not going to spend time with the questions because you can look at these yourself. I'm just going to whiz through them. And I'm just saying several days for much of a muchness really so <laughs> sorry about this <laughs> okay and I think we've probably gone on to the GAD7 questions now which are obviously the generalized anxiety disorder questions so this this questionnaire is made up of the PHQ9 and the GAD7 questions and then we finish the questionnaire and you get a results pathway. So based on the algorithm, which again, I will come to in a moment, this would say that this person who's answered these questions would fit within a mild, mild to moderate um, range of mental health need. It would give some self-help information, some intervention details, some links for support. 
we will also have a link to find your local IAPT provider. Um, we are conscious that this website will not be able to provide local information because it is a national website. So as a clinician who's using this tool with families, it, it, that's your role really to, um, to give that local detail. And then there's obviously some safety netting information here at the bottom. Now, if you are a clinician that has, has worked through this question with the family, you can click on view summary and that will show you all of the answers, um, how they've answered. So that will help you um, maybe in unpicking um, how they're feeling, because I guess what you really want to establish is is what life is like for them. What what is what are they having particular difficulty with? So you can access these answers um, and actually see, you know, how they came to that. Um, the pathways, if I just click up here, you'll see that we've got the pathways here as an A to D and then the E maternal mental health service. So it just completely correlates with the pathways we were talking about earlier. This tool is it's really important to note that whilst it can absolutely be used individually by people in their homes, it can be used uh, in a clinical setting, it can be used with peer supporters. It, it, it's so um, the, the accessibility to it and the availability of its use um, is, is not restricted at all. I'm actually going to come out of this now. That was a very brief snapshot of the um, of the tool. Has that gone back to my have I changed screens? Yes, you yes, have. have. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. It's just I can't see the team, so I don't I don't know if it has. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that I just wanted to show you the tool. It is um, it's very simple. It's very easy to use. And, you, you know, the, the best thing I can suggest to you is at the end of this call is actually go and log on and have a look at it yourself, because that that is how you really get a feel for the tool. And I feel that that little demo really doesn't tell you, um, you know, how great it is in practice. Hopefully I can give you some more information as we go on. So the algorithm and I. Um, this is what some people might consider the boring bit, but for me, actually, it's, it's probably quite an important bit. So as I've already said, um, the pathway, the the tool has two different directions, one for pregnant people, one for partners. So pregnant people will be asked um, perinatal specific questions. They will be asked red flag questions and they will be asked questions related to services that are offered by the maternal mental health service in addition to the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 questions. Partners will only be asked, as we've just seen, the PHQ-9 and GAD-7 questions. And the reason for this is that the PHQ-9 and the GAD-7 are evidence-based measures for all people, whereas the other measures are perinatal specific and are only relevant and tried and tested with the pregnant and postnatal population. So um, you will see that the collection of questions is slightly different. The tool has been developed so that it scores each question to each of the sections um, shown in bullet points one to four. Um, the score for each section will then be placed on the care pathway A to D, um, so mild to crisis. The pathway that is then recommended at the end is the one that is the highest um, in terms of A, B, C, D, uh, which, which out of these top four um, had the highest score. That will be the recommended pathway. Um, and then if they have a recommendation for um, the maternal mental health service, that will be, for example, pathway A plus E. So if the mental health, men, maternal mental health service uh, is recommended as well, that will be in addition to an A to D pathway. So just to give you an example of, of what that looks like in, in um, practice, so we might have a woman that completes a questionnaire. She is um, a woman who has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Um, which would be a perinatal specific question, um, but on all other measures so the PHQ-9, the GAD-7, red flags, she, she has no current mental health needs, she is well. So this will still mean that the questionnaire will place her on pathway C to ensure that the referral is made to a specialist perinatal mental health team to ensure that we have um, care plan in place due to the known risk of postnatal illness for women with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Um, partners will not be asked the perinatal specific questions or the red flag questions, so their results for the screen and test will, as I said, be solely based on the PHQ-9 and GAT-7 and pathway C for partners rather than saying specialist perinatal, it would obviously say input by a secondary mental health team may be indicated Whereas for pregnant people, it will say a specialist perinatal mental health team. 
So how can we be confident that the tool works? Well, again, I have to apologise because I'm aware that today is about dads and partners, um, but the evaluation that is um, with this group is ongoing. So for the moment, I'm just going to share some findings from an evaluation of the tool that I undertook with the maternity um, on its use with pregnant women. So I looked at 120 sets of maternity records to obtain a sample. I had inclusion criteria that meant that the screening tool had to have been used within the previous three months and that pathways B or C were identified by the tool. I excluded pathway A outcomes from my evaluation because I felt that they represented well-being or minor concerns that were likely already being met or being met by GP services. So there would be no assessment or follow up from mental health services, whether that's IAPT or secondary services, that would include an assessment to confirm if the tool had re re reliably triaged and signposted. Similarly, I excluded pathway D outcomes because crisis can be an acute standalone incident and I wanted to look specifically at women um, that were remained open to services so I could review the tool against their clinical assessments and ongoing care. So looking at pathway B, firstly, we can see that there were 76 women who had this recommendation, 73 of whom um, accepted referral to their local IAPT provider and one person declined uh, referral to support, but did receive signpost and, and safety net and information as part of that outcome. There were two records that the perinatal pathway screening tool triaged pathway B that when we reviewed them we found they were already open to the perinatal mental health team which would indicate that their mental health need was in a moderate sphere range and would place them on pathway C. Um, this pathway, this triage to pathway B may be a result of an interventional support that was already in place from the perinatal mental health team and actually the affected uh, reduction in the severity of their symptoms since they were actually referred and opened to secondary services. Of the 73 that accepted an IAPT referral and um, following the triage from that provider, um, four of them were subsequently then referred to the perinatal mental health team as shown in the pie chart. So therefore, of the 76 women triaged to IAPT from the use of the tool, in 69 of those cases, we can be confident that pathway B was the appropriate outcome. One case does remain unknown due to them declining ongoing support. So moving on to pathway C, so we had 30 sets of notes where pathway C was the outcome from the tool and as shown in the bar chart in 15 cases this person was already open to the perinatal mental health team and 14 new perinatal mental health referrals were made. One of the referrals um, was actually declined by the specialist perinatal team and redirected to IAPT and one of the women again declined a referral. And as before, she will have been provided with signposting and safety net and information on completion of the tool. So this once again demonstrates that in 28 out of 30 cases reviewed, pathway C was um, correctly identified. Um, as I said, one case was declined at referral and one was redirected following an assessment. So to summarise, in over 90% of the records we reviewed, the perinatal pathway screening tool correctly triaged respondents' answers to the right place on the perinatal mental health care pathways. This gives us confidence in the tool's efficacy to risk assess, triage, signpost, and furthermore demonstrates that the perinatal pathway screening tool is a reliable means of screening pregnant women in the perinatal period. However, it really is important that this tool is not viewed as replacing the role of healthcare practitioners in the screening process, but rather is viewed as an aid to facilitate a meaningful conversation around following its use, as well as obviously to give confidence to healthcare practitioners that there is support available and a referral pathway to follow. And local providers obviously will be able to give information about local support services. And that brings us back to dads and partners and to consider if this tool meets the objectives from the long term plan. So the objective stated we needed to ensure that partners of women accessing specialist mental health services and maternity outreach clinics or maternal mental health services as we know them now receive evidence based assessment of their mental health and are signposted to support as required. So we believe this tool can overcome the challenges that some services are experiencing in realising this ambition. And we believe this because the perinatal pathway screening tool provides an evidence based platform screening. It offers signpost into support at an appropriate level according to risk and need and offers immediate safety net and information um, to users on completion of the tool. 
to date, the feedback from the perinatal mental health team that is trialling this tool with dads and partners have found it to be 100% reliable in correctly triaging and signposting to the right support. So that gives us um, real confidence and um, enthusiasm as we share this with you today that, that this will help us all. So as we've said, the screening tool can be completed by self-assessment with peer support in a healthcare setting at home, etc. There's absolutely no restrictions on who can use the tool, what settings it can be used. The measures are evidence-based. The tool offers an objective and standardised method of screening, triages answers and its signposts to report. So we're really confident as we present this tool to you today, there is a valuable aid to all services in realising this ambition from the long-term plan in terms of the screening for dads and partners. And that brings us to our conclusion. So thank you so much for listening. Um, myself and Jenny um, would be absolutely delighted to take any questions and our contact details are there on the screen for you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you. That was that really, really good. good. Sorry, I've Sorry, got a horrible echo. I don't know I don't if know everyone else is hearing it as well. well. There, 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 I'll mute. There is um, a question in the chat about what system collects the data for us. And I have no idea, Jules, so I'm hoping you might be able to answer that. Sorry, I'm muted. Um, I've absolutely no idea. I suppose we should have asked maybe one of the tech developers um, to attend with us. We, we, we are working with a tech company um, that are obviously hosting and um, working on this. Um, I've added the website, I can see there's a question in the chat about open access via the website. It, yes, you can, if anyone has access to the website. Um, and at the moment, the answers can't be downloaded or, and added to clinical records, but we are looking at further developments um, for the tool in terms of recording and Download. And at the moment, it holds no data from um, people who use it, and it takes no identifying data, it takes no names, no contact, no demographics at all, other than are you pregnant or are you a partner? Um, uh, what, what I would say to people, if um, if you want to go on and use it with dads, we still could do with some more feedback around the efficacy with dads and partners and and as Jules said so far with the pilot with dads um, it is proving to be as reliable as it is with the um, women and birthing people but we could always do with some more data so if if you do go off and use it you know if it's working great tell us and and, and also really importantly if you think it isn't accurate for whatever reason, do do give us that feedback too, um, because it's all really helpful in building up the picture. I mean, I, th I think it's right to say, Jules, we're pretty confident, aren't we, that it's yeah. doing yeah. doing what we wanted it to do. But obviously, yeah. the more the more feedback we get, the better. Absolutely, we we've um, we tried this over a twelve month period in one um, trust in. Wessex and we then launched it across the four trusts in January of this year. Um, so yeah, we, we are pretty confident that it, it you, you know, our results speak for itself at the moment and, and what midwives are telling us in terms of their use, uh, mm. that it, it is, it, it's accurate. And with the trust that's piloting it with the dads, it's their carers, peer support workers that are using it. So, um, I guess that goes back to what I was saying about not overcomplicating that ambition with dads. And I know we've got a couple of people on the on the webinar today from the national team. And I guess I guess you would you would share that, would you, to say that you know this is an ambition that we think can be met in a fairly painless way if if we um, don't overcomplicate it by sort of thinking we've got to open case notes for the dads and partners, et cetera, et cetera, when you, when you could use a simple tool like this and still achieve the ambition without um, all the sort of accomplishments that you have if, if, you, if you go and um, make a, um, 
have to open case notes. So hopefully that will be helpful to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think like most things, it's what we found both with the midwives and with the carers, peer support workers, it does open up other conversations about mental health um, because you've got that tool there. It, it's almost like a much easier way of, of having those conversations because all the, you know, the, the tools mm -hmm. asking it. So um, I think we've had a lot of feedback from both the midwives and the carers, peer support workers that it makes for people that aren't mental health trained, it actually makes having asking those questions a bit easier. Yeah, um, it takes responsibility away, doesn't it? It asks the yeah. question so objectively yeah. and the risk assessment is done for you. It's, it's yeah. Can I just answer a question from Deborah very quickly? Um, there's a question in the chat. Is it only for expectant parents? Um, it can be used in the postnatal period. Um, I would suggest caution in in and uh, clinical judgment and how you use it postnatally just because with the GAD7 and the PHQ9 obviously they're asking about tiredness and and some of these things which we know are part of the normal post -gen postnatal journey with a newborn baby so um, yes absolutely it, you know the red flag questions are, are, are covered but I think when you use it postnatally is just make sure that you look at the answers just to establish um, is the pathway a result of um, some of the normal adaptation Patients to parenthood or is it because they're um, responding positively to a red flag so just um, you know make sure that the that you are reviewing the answers is what I would say we we have primarily with the maternity focused on the pregnant women using it sorry Jenny Thanks. and um, we've also got this will be the last question I think before we move on to Julian one from Lucy to ask if we had any comms planned for the launch. <laughs> no, I think the webinars probably are comms, Lucy, to be fair. Um, but um, we will um, be tweeting about it as well. So we'll we'll there'll be a bit of action on Twitter, but we hadn't planned for anything wider than that. Um, Thank you ever so much. I wonder whether, um, Jules, whether I may be able to kind of pick this up with you, because uh, so, I'm from Hampshire and I, I see that that's kind of within your patch. So if I can yeah. kind of pick this up in terms of seeing how we can kind of get the message out there, that'd be really yeah, useful. Yeah, please. Please do. Yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, brilliant. Um, Jules, there's another question in the chat. Can I leave you to pick yeah. that one up and I'll introduce yes. Julian? Lovely. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so it's our, a day of having um, superstar speakers. I'm not talking about myself here, but I'm thinking more of Elliot and Julian and Jules, of course. So um, I remember um, DadPad in its very early iteration. So I'm really excited to hear all about it and uh, all the adaptations that have happened along the way so handing over to Julian thank you Julian fantastic can you hear me okay and can you see me anyone let me know yes we can perfect yeah. um, so hello I'm Julian uh, Bowes I'm founder and developer of DadPad it's really uh, great to be here and and to be honest the superstar is, is superstars waiting for you tools such as this um, uh, and hearing Elliot and some of the services that he's providing um, that really have impact for, for dads um, as they make that transition to parenthood. Um, and obviously the real story he shared, which which is immense and amazing and hopefully he'll continue to do that for a long time. We need more men talking about um, how becoming a parent has affected them. Um, and just the reality, if we want to um, if we want to have better, brighter communities, we need to be engaging with men a lot earlier in this whole perinatal period. And that's really why I started um, the dad pad. The dad pad was 10, 15 years ago. It was, a, it was an idea, a kernel of an idea. And I sat on my local perinatal mental health board. Um, there'll be people on this course who call have seen my presentation who actually are dad pad areas. Uh, shout out to Joseph Madabon Mays there somewhere um, in, from Buckinghamshire. Um, but I'll go on to show, hopefully, through a presentation, how we've developed, where we've come from and to how we're embedded in quite a lot of your maternity systems and services that really need that impact from the workforce to make it 
work at its best to make sure those dads are seen and engaged. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. I will include audio and it should come up any second. And here we have a slideshow. So as long as you can still see me, hopefully somewhere in the screen, can you see me uh, as a little picture somewhere? Yes. Yes, right. And I'm holding up two of my dad pads. So these are two essential guides, wipeable guides, uh, cards. They can dads can read them during the pregnancy. Um, card at a time. We have an illustrated version, a lot of public health messaging, all produced. We have a neonatal version that I talked about uh, that Jenny mentioned that won a BMA award. Got some exciting plans going on in the ship area of those this year. Um, because the neonatal unit is 178 of them, we also need to include, because that's where dads will go and experience potential trauma too, but we need them engaged a lot earlier. I'll start with a, a little bit of a, talking about where it came from, is about whenever you find a new dad, they obviously become a new dad, really, as soon as they find out, or even the journey too, thinking about having a baby, they start to think about what it might be like. You know, Elliot described seeing new dads in, a, in the playground and wanting that. Um, and often what happens is it becomes real when you see that little line in the window or a GP sits you down and tells you, you know, you're going to be parents and you're going to be a dad. And you go away and you feel great and you feel excited, but you can also feel very nervous. You can feel unsure and you can feel overwhelmed. And I certainly felt that when I found out I was going to be a father. My background was uh, I did a degree in psychology. I liked doing a lot of the childhood development stuff. I then worked for probation for my main job for 14 years, working with men in group rooms for up to nine months at a time, two and a half hours a week, 20,000 hours in a group room with men talking about engagement, getting them to take off their masks, whether it be motor mouth, angel mask, whatever it was they were wearing to try and get to the real people underneath and how they were, go, how they were living their lives and what new goals they should be setting themselves. So cognitive change was my thing. And we, but we always look back to think of when we become older men and we look at becoming older men, we look to think, what did we leave behind? Were we good fathers and partners? Now, a lot of the men I worked with weren't, but certainly there wasn't much of an opportunity when I certainly became a new father, was going to be a new father. When I looked around about how I was going to make this transition, there wasn't anything there. 2006, 2010, still, I started to develop this as a local, uh, as part of a local cl clinical uh, perinatal. Uh, mental health kind of board meet, uh, meeting in, in, in Cornwall. We were multi-agency, we were really lucky. So we had health visiting, midwifery, um, social work, we had um, uh, safeguarding, and we had all the people that we were seeing dads on a regular basis, but they were all saying similar things. We can't get them to engage. We don't know what they are thinking. They don't look interested. I'm sure they feel a bit left out. We want to do something, what can we do? So we came up with a pack and uh, a kind of bag and, and these, this, these pads and we sent them back out. And the response was they're finding they're suddenly engaging, they're switching on. We've got things to talk to them about um, and so on and so forth. So that's where it came from. We kind of developed more recently a lot of hints and tips um, that I'll just bring up. So best practice tips for engaging dads things that we can share with all our dad pad areas. Um, we've got 10 ways of engaging, what to say, how to say it, reasons and uh, ways in these best, best practices. We've got 30 tips in all to, to give and we developed that as part of a, uh, a perinatal uh, mental health alliance um, alongside Mark Williams, Kieran from Dad Matters, as Elliot mentioned, and a few others last year to try and help clinicians on the ground in their engagement and to help open up those men's conversations but really where it starts is with the engagement so what we're doing with the dad pad is trying to give these dads the knowledge and practical skills to support themselves their partner so that babies get that start and that's just your standard uh, you know elevator pitch we're trying to get these men to be more um equality based co-parents with their head in the game a lot earlier so they're able to open up to people so they're able to potentially link into and do the questionnaire the tool that you've just described earlier so that they can get some support and we can help to build support services a little bit earlier before it gets to crisis and they can be a part of mum's journey if mum is um, unwell they can help to spot any signs and symptoms they can get mum to help earlier which we all know is what we need to do in order to help 
um, get them get over the, any pre and postnatal uh, mental health issue that they may suffer and get that baby, those parents that they deserve, who they're looking up at, that kind of stability that they that we have in our power to give them and gift them. And it's not just for those parents in those early years, it's for our future communities. That's what I'm saying. It's our future cultures and our future uh, society. We need to start building these parents earlier because at the moment, what we're doing is not really having the whole picture. When we look at, for example, thinking family, what we need to do is think about how you need to engage them as a whole. And we know this, we've been had words like think family banded around for quite a few years now. All the evidence is there for it to be done. We just need that workforce to meet those men and partners and those mums in that same space and their families as well to make sure that they're all included. And DadPad is one way to try and do that. It's to be about prevention. It's about to make sure we're pulling people out of the um, river no more what we're doing is going right to the start and we're making sure these people have got the best chance in learning together and working together we're reducing conflict around relationships before it becomes a problem excuse me so what we're aiming to achieve all the evidence some of which you'll find in all our blogs from our website at the dadpad.co.uk there's a key content section with all our blogs and a lot of the evidence there and what we're trying to 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 uh to show is based on all this evidence-based research you've talked about your assessment tool um jenny and uh, jules about the evidence base this is all rooted in evidence just like all the cognitive change work we've ever done it is about demonstrating impact it's demonstrating progress and it's demonstrating effectiveness to be used and we've got a lot of this under our belt we know how to support um these uh, mums as they transition to motherhood um, with lots of skills. There's nothing that a dad can't do apart from breastfeed that can be involved in terms of that shared care aspect. So during the development of this dad pad over the last 10 years, we've got this golden opportunity moment between naught to two where we can work with these men. They're most motivated to uh, make these changes. And that is a quote from me um, we have, but it's also part of, um, legitimate quotes from Father Institute papers from, from a long time ago. It is studied that it is a moment where men's motivation is highest um, for them to change behaviour. Um, and they're ready to play this part. We've seen it. We've seen it when we've walked the wards. We know mums and, and, and Elliot cited some of the statistics that Mark um, put in front of you in terms of his report that we sponsored and wrote for him that went to um, the MPs. It is about making sure that, that um, these dads, because well, they are wanting to be present, they're part of the scale, come to the scans 90 plus percent, they do attend appointments. We just want them to make sure that they're engaged and that they know, and that when they leave the hospital with their baby and no one else is there, they don't have to keep putting the stress and pressure onto mums and mums extended family, asking what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? We want them to have an idea and um, to be able to go off and have those golden moments with those babies and be that kind of confident dad that they can be. And way, the way we do this and the way we've done this around different parts of the um, country so far is we, we give out um, a few thousand of the pads and a four year uh, license to our app and, and the app that, um, and, and with the pads they use to engage them physically because you've got the support opportunities um, and you've got these different support opportunities at every stage. Um, they start to feel more involved and focused. As he starts to understand his role, he becomes more engaged and active. Another support opportunity, whether it be advocacy, peer support, um, as you call it, whether it be Kieran up in Manchester, going into antenatal units um, and uh, birth centres and talking to dads and, or pop-up shops. Um, is we've got to find these dads as well to populate these organisations. And um, I, I, I hope that but through using DadPad, we're starting to get more dads involved in the early years and men in the early years and partners. Um, so when dad is this asset and ally to spot any potential problems, either at birth and or beyond or during the pregnancy um, around any mental health issues for his partner and himself, because dads do suffer from uh, PND too. We do need to make sure that they've got places to go. And there aren't that many at the minute. There are places now that are opening up, as Elliot describes, whether it be through um, Andy's Man Club, 
um, Leeds Dads, um, Errol up there, Douglas Soul. Um, you've got Dave Perrins running the DAG course down in Brighton. And hopefully we can help in, in kind of spreading the word of what, what there is out there. But also giving dads a voice through using DadPad in the app. I'll show you how we can do that in a minute. They also, um, why is it now? So it really is about engagement. All these new, um, so Elliot's been working on it a few years, it's getting great traction and, and talking and speaking to nationally, uh, meeting um, Andrew Ledsom, talking about family hubs. We need to make sure that we have got these people, these dads engaged really early on because we're not gonna get, we're only get the same people coming through if we don't change the engagement model. And that's what we're hopefully providing to make sure we're referring people to the right space and place and for them to learn how to adapt and grow. As we find out from dads, what it is they need during the pregnancy, the birth process and beyond um, in a much bigger way. So we have data. Um, so forgive me, we, we, we're not going to get bums on seats unless we engage properly. So that's the way to learn. Um, and obviously, if you're twi Twitterers, you can follow us at Dadpad UK and you can have a look around. And there is a video that you can watch um, that I'll put in the chat box or Yvette or um, or Jenny can put the link in for me so that you can you can see from farm to plate exactly what that pad is and how it works. It's probably going to start, but I'll move it on. Um, can you still hear me? Are you still there, by the way? Yes, yes, we oh, are. Per perfect. So um, so in our standard resources, we cover a lot of the things during the uh, the the, the co-produced um, kind of panels and focus groups um, and dads have said over the years of what they'd like to have in front of them um, in that uh, pre-birth period so that they're ready for post-birth and it is about not overwhelming dads at this stage we as dads as men we have not been socialized to think around um, having babies at home what we should do we need to make sure um, because there's not that much information out there for them and and to be honest culturally and society we haven't been prepared in that way it needs to change and this is partly a step towards that so it is a normal it's normal that we are looking at these things as we become men that we might have a child and the child comes home and we need to be there and we need to be doing things and we need to be looking after our partner and ourselves uh, in terms of our own mental health and we need to be formulating plans together we need to understand each other's expectations but the way to do it from now on where we are is to make sure our services and our dads are hearing and getting quality evidence-based information that is all signed off clinically. So currently we're in 25 areas. We've got another few launching um, as well this, this um, year. Um, so we covered large parts of the country, nearly two thirds I'd say of England itself. And we have just come into to Wales. Um, and each of these areas, they've got a few years of the app and a few thousands of dad pads, you know, they come on back and buy more because they're such in great and good engagement tools. Um, and within our app and within our pad, we do um, use different um, national campaigns such as Icon. We'd love to be a, a staunch advocate of your new tool, um, Jenny and Jules, to make sure that they're seeing that they can self, they can self complete something, dad. So immediately in our app, we can put into the health, uh, mental health section, something for them that talks about not only signs and symptoms for mum and himself and how to look after himself, but also a tool that he can go to through your website to make that assessment, something we can embed in a drop of a hat and we can get it over 25 areas immediately if that's what you want to do. Um, we just have to make sure the commissioners those areas are happy to do so and off we go. Our app currently has, uh, these are the new areas that are coming on soon and we're just making a bit of a foray into Wales. Um, and some big areas like Cheshire, Merseyside, Cambridge and Peterborough, um, Humber launching and, and these others too. Inside our pads, as I said, you've got um, uh, the, those different topics that we talked about. I know we're struggling for time, so I'm just trying to, to, to whip you through this. Uh, and in terms of uh, national initiatives icon, so it's something we can do similarly with your tool is to make sure we're meant, you're mentioning um, Give, do a big feature on it we can write a blog with you about it particularly we'd love to do that to make sure people can um, use our, our blogs as, as resources outside the app as well um, a lot um, and we have our neonatal side of it that I mentioned earlier that we are trying to to grow and develop for those dads within units across the country 
Um, so we, we have worked with all these different agencies in terms of SOFARs, and we are commissioned by each of these uh, in different spaces and places. So perinatally, um, the new clinical networks, we're in about eight or nine different recent um, perinatal mental health teams commissioned for their area and then worked alongside the maternity uh, settings and visit health visiting teams and public health teams and your whether you've got best start in life initiatives on the go whether you have family hubs coming up your public health teams um, your safeguarding and your local maternity voices partnerships to roll it out so they've been gifting some of the pads into the spaces and places needed works very well so in Hampshire for example when I met the high impact board they bought enough dad pads to have a lot of different spaces and places to make it start feeling normal um, and then they also push out all the messaging that they want. Not only do we have the, so uh, the current app as it is, has all the topics that I've described in it, um, but you have the in the area section that Elliot alluded to. So when they walk out of the hospital, they've got in one space and place, all the local and a lot of national, you know, such as we can refer to music rather than football, Elliot, we can make sure we do a feature, put it in there so that, they can find you and find support in areas that are, that are local to them without having to trawl lots of different websites and which can be quite um, hard to find information. And we're talking about a vulnerable person here. As any of you pregnant person, it's, it's what we, we talk about them being vulnerable to the change that's about to happen that will impact their lives massively. I'll give you a quick story. So the quick story is when I first went out to, to uh, test whether dad pads were gonna be useful, um, I went to 70, about 70 mother care expectant parents events a couple of years ago, did nearly 50,000 miles all over the country. And um, to, a, to an event, there'd be a big semicircle of chairs of new parents being there. Mum would normally typically be four to six weeks away, and they'd be going kind of later in the pregnancy to see what they can get, starting to get everything ready. But this was the first time dad had actually sat down and heard a health visitor and a midwife talk about what what's what what is what and um they I'd, I'd appear on stage and i'd wave my little dad pad and i'd go we've developed this over years with you in mind some hints and tips so you can understand what you're going to be needed to do and uh, just flip through it you don't have to absorb it all you don't have to absorb it, read it like a book religiously just pick a few things and have a good go build your confidence and be there for be there for mum and, and and talk about these things and uh, the first five people in the queue would always come towards me very quickly afterwards and they'd be paler visibly and they'd be shaking. And it, I just, thank God you're here, a few of them would say. And it was, it was such a revelation to think that they'd only just realised that their lives were about to change because they that's what they'd say. My life's not going to be the same, is it? My life's about to change, isn't it? And, you know, I'd say, let's start by looking at something here. And I'm very, very, very aware that at the time, there's not that many groups out there for men, run by men potentially, it doesn't have to be run by men, but just having groups out there that are open and accessible for these men to go to. And what I'm hoping is that we can start to build that kind of groundswell of evidence and voice to make sure that communities can start to build these groups. And some of the men that come through by using this and becoming visible, hopefully we'll be running these in the future, will become part of a peer support network. Um, such as Elliot, such as Dad Matters, such as the, the courses that I've met, others, their dad course, etc. Uh, we've got a new app coming out very soon. So we've been investing um, and working with Orca to make sure it's all um, perfect for you in the NHS. And to switch this on, um, I'll talk about that at the end. Um, I'll come back to that one. So the app has a change of look. It has uh, a new interface, lots of accessibility. Um, we've got 10 languages um, translated so far, but actually they are, because it contains, contains a lot of this clinical information, um, they're all human translated um, in terms of three levels of, of uh, review and making sure that they are uh, not like a Google a translate, so it, it, it's so accurate. Um, and then, We've got a profile section for themselves. We can push notifications out. And this is where you'll find the community forums managed by, by us with you locally on the ground to make sure that the dads have got voices to talk about what's going on for them, 
to pay it forward and part of a social contract to make sure that they're there to understand, to help all kind of dads and build this future for dads of education um, throughout their kind of transition to parenthood so that they support each other. Um, and we can have, you can have your universities have their own community hub uh, it, within the app to make sure that instead of asking me to put out tweets to find dads for a certain thesis or a project, you will be able to have a space to interact with them and pull every new dad through to these and, and suggest if you'd like to help other dads, this is what you can do too. And so in all these areas in dad pads, you can have this buildup of knowledge and they can start to build in, in big numbers, the kind of um, research. Um, we might be able to get a lot of your surveys filled in through um, through this system as well. And we signpost still to local services, um, some more automated way as well. So there's lots coming to, to the new app in terms of that. Um, I just want to go back a little bit just to say we do have our blog section. Please feel free to have a good look at that once you've um, finished and you want to have a bit further look. Um, there's key content. Um, blogs uh, would be good to look at first. Why we work with dads, that big proportion, 97.8. But what we have done, um, but we've because we've been very conscious that not every new per, every new um, parent transitioning to parenthood um, is a male new dad, clearly. We've been working with um, different organisations on our co-parent resource, which is virtually finished. It'll be going to print soon. That'll be sent out to all our new areas. So it's like our pads, um, but it's for um, those who don't ident identify. So we've been working with LGBT um, QI plus organisations, non-birthing, non-gestational parents. That's who it's for. So we've been working over a year and a half with MVPs um, with organisations in the field to make sure you have that resource. So all partners are covered, essentially, um, for, um, alongside the, the work you do with mum. They'll have a dad pad or a co-parent pad and we'll be flipping them all onto the app as soon as that's um, ready and up and going as well. So and that will be free for all our dad pad areas. And um, we've done some home birth work. Um, we're looking at doing some birth prep and early parenting guided learning, um, either with partners or um, we'll develop them ourselves. Um, but it's a very exciting time. Um, we know we have a lot of areas who are currently dad pad areas. We want to make more use of, of what they've got dad pad for uh, and how to work, how to use it. Um, happy to, to talk to any areas in your area that haven't got dad pad. Um, I know that we have got quite a few different areas in southeast, but we we have got a lot in around um, London. We've got to get to as well, and we're hoping we can do that. When we, we spoke to Andrew Lodes a couple of weeks ago, but it, it is a case of um, anyone you know wanting to get involved, let me know. Um, and I will come on to questions because I've whizzed through a lot of that. Um, yeah, there's just some of the imagery from inside our co-parenting pad. Uh, we're looking at forces and military forces, uh, keeping families connected pad as well with the military that's been developed. Um, and just um, we talked about pandemic and how it's such shone this huge light on the fact that we know their mum, our mums need dads and partners support. And often they weren't able to be there. Um, we're developing as part of the comp funding, um, national comp funding, the, the uh, some COVID um, video it's COVID related to pregnancy and birth information for for those who find themselves in that unique space really um, Mark Williams is doing a few videos around it Scott around trauma Scott Mayer sorry um, to make sure that they've got a section for themselves as part of this community um, group that we have on the new app to make sure they've got a place to go to directly to, um, to, to find what's currently available and what will be coming down the line but obviously these people would be right for looking at something and extra support and building support services. So um, that's where your tool might fit in too. I'll whiz through these. We've just had some testimonials there, but I'm, I'm sure I can send this uh, out to you so you can have a good look at it through your, um, in your own time. And uh, yeah, that's it really. I'm gonna come back off out of that and just mention, We've got, um, can you still see me? Yeah. We've got our um, Fathers Reaching Out uh, Why Does Matters report that um, Mark Williams, uh, we, we, we wrote that for him and sponsored it. We've got our pads. 
and each area goes out with our cards and stickers and posters to make sure that in every touch point, like your scanning rooms and beyond, um, but essentially it's getting that early engagement right to make sure that you potentially as a perinatal service, mental health service, are getting the right referrals and we're building a knowledge base, giving dads a voice to build that knowledge base of uh, so that we can get the funding into spaces where they can start to have these interim potential stop waypoints where they can get help before it becomes too much of an issue so we can prevent not just wait till they, let things get to crisis because the biggest gap that has been in maternity is who's the dad who's the bloke in the room who's the partner and a lot that they do can undermine what you're doing with mum they can be such a support for what happens with mum whether it be on the road to recovery whether it's to prevent any kind of illness but certainly those couples are in relationships and they have a baby and further down the line you need those couples to have relationships still if you want to have the best impact for those uh, children as they grow um well i've whisked through that because i realized uh time if there are any questions please um please uh, please let me know <laughs> Julian, thank you so much. And I'm sorry I've been such a rubbish timekeeper. I have to say I'm I'm missing Liz because she's much better at the timekeeping than I am. That's OK. So I do apologise. But a lot of people have stayed with it and clearly interested in, in what you had to say. So that's good. Super. Um, I don't think there's any questions in the chat. Um, so... But people will have your um, email, so you, we've got your slides, haven't we? And we can send them out to everybody that's on the call. Um, yeah, please do. And anyone who isn't in a uh, isn't in a dad pad area, get in touch. Um, and if you want to hear some more, we can have another conversation. Um, that would be great. Excellent. So it's a brilliant resource, and it's lovely to see the way that it's grown as well. I'm really interested in getting yourself um, on another call, Jenny, to talk about how you want to integrate your tool. Um, okay, if at all. perfect. Um, and obviously, Elliot, love to speak to you again, mate. Really good to see you and hear you. Lovely. Well, thank you to all of today's speakers and to all of you for um, staying with it, despite my rubbish timekeeping. Um, so I'll close now. And thanks again to everybody. And we'll see um see you again next month okay thank you very much bye bye